Tēnā koutou. Nā mihi nui kia koutou, no mai, haere mai, ki te webinar, All Things Incorporated Societies, what we need to know um, and, you know, and how, how we can be sure that we're taking um, the right steps. First of all, do we need to be an incorporated society? Um, what do we do if we want to remain one? Um, and, and how do we make sure um, that we're reporting in the right way? So, um, Yo, ko Katie Bruce, Tokoingwa. I'm Katie Bruce, um, and I work for Huye, and I'm joined here by Michelle Kitney um, from Volunteer in New Zealand, and we're excited to be working together um, because you know we we get to work with each other a lot in our job, and we're really excited that um, so many of you are interested and that we can bring um, this discussion um, to you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start us off um, with a karakia um, and then pass over to Michelle to tell us a little bit more about um, why we're gathered um, here today and what you can expect from this webinar. So I'm starting us off with a, with a karakia that we'll all know. So um, feel free to join in, Fano, from, from wherever you are. Karakia tato. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mā kina kina ki uta, ki a mā tara tara ki tai, e hiaki ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, ti hei mauri wara. Kia ora koutou katoa, ko Michelle Kitni a hau. Um, I uh, have the privilege of leading Volunteering New Zealand to our Aotearoa and it's super exciting to be here today um, collaborating with uh, Katie Bruce from Hui Community Aotearoa but also with the team from XRB, IRD and um, uh, Harry Fields. So incorporated societies um, are a key structure um, for enabling community and voluntary participation. So they're really, really important. Sports clubs, support clubs, member organisations across the Motu um, use uh, the incorporated society um, structures to organise themselves. And um, as most people will know, there's a new act that's come into force in uh, 2022. It was a long time in the making and it was actually really important and much needed because the old act was drafted in 1908 uh, and a lot of things have changed since then. Um, so today's session brings you some key updates. Um, do you want to introduce people at the same time? Or? Yeah, I could, yeah, I could do that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, some key updates that are really important right now um, to know about. Um, uh, so just before Katie introduces our um, amazing panel, I just wanted to note that we are recording this session. So uh, we will make this available in an additional uh, array of um, resource, resources that um, might support you to this. We uh, warmly invite you to use the Q&A function um, after we've heard from each of the panellists, we will run a Q&A, a question and answer session. The chat function is also open and um, feel free to use that if you want to do any um, discussion, discursive stuff with uh, participants, but um, please direct all the um, questions to the chat so we can manage them. And it's really um, phenomenal to have so many people here today. So thank you very much. And pass back to Katie. Great. So today we are joined by, and you'll be able to see them on your screen at the moment. We're joined by um, Stephen Moe, charity lawyer extraordinaire, and a name that will be familiar to, um, to so many of you, I'm sure. And our challenge today will be to come up with a question that he hadn't, hasn't already heard on Incorporated Societies. Uh, I think that might be a good one. You can let us know, Stephen, um, if we manage to do so. Then we've got Jay Casey, who's joining us from IRD on all things tax. And we really appreciate actually a couple of government agencies coming in and saying, actually, while we're hearing about these changes, um, you also need to know about this and, and kind of collaborating to do that together. So we really appreciate you being here, Jay, as well. And then finally, we will hear from um, XRB. So we're here from Michelle Lombard and Alex Stainer from XRB. And like, I really need to do a really big shout out to them in particular. It was their idea to bring this information 
to you. And their job, essentially, their job is to come up with the reporting standards. They don't have to then, um, you know, do go that extra mile and engage. They really wanted to make sure um, that they did that. They did that. So nami, nami hi nui um, to, to both of you. And I will pass over first to Stephen. Well, tēnā koto katoa. Uh, no America a hō no te tematanga, uh, no ota tahi toku kainga inai nei, e roia toku tunga mahi o Perifield Lawyers, ko Stephen Motaku Ingoa, no reira nā mihi kia koto katoa. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. I love these sorts of sessions, getting the chance to spread information out there. Um, I work as a lawyer, as has been said, I'm based down in Ototahi, but helping many, many groups across the country. And that includes, to be honest, I've kind of lost track there's more than a hundred in corporate societies, probably into the hundreds that we're helping now, um, because there's quite a lot of need at the moment, and that's what we're going to get into. So my um, my role today is really to introduce some of the changes and be able to set out for you the key things that you need to know. And I'm going to do that with a couple slides, and I think these slides will be made available afterwards. So don't feel like you have to like be noting down all the content. Um, but uh, the the key point is that in corporate societies, companies, charitable trusts, they're all different legal entity types. What you can't ever forget is that our organizations should remain focused on their purpose and the impact that they want to have. The legal entity type that you are is simply a tool to help you achieve your purpose and impact. So don't get too distracted by all of the detail and the content because we have to always keep in mind what's the kaupapa, the purpose that we're actually here for. So I'm gonna share a few slides now. And this is where um, technology is going to help us, hopefully. <laughs> So hopefully you can see that this is just a intro slide um, and I'm gonna be focusing here on what changes result. So the first question is who does this actually impact? I get asked this more often than you'd think. So I put here, this is from the end of last year, um, the number of charities which are registered with charity services. So the number's gone up a little bit, but you can see there the total. So the, the really, the type of entity that is impacted is the first one incorporated societies. There's other entity types which are registered charities, but they will not be impacted the way that incorporated societies are. So you've got trusts, you've got companies. Um, the unincorporated societies might be impacted if you decided to incorporate. Um, so, but that's really who we're talking to is the incorporated societies. As well as those which are registered charities, there's some incorporate societies which are not registered charities. So there's actually about 23,000 incorporate societies. These ones on this page here, those are just the registered charities. Um, so the point of this slide is that I quite often get people who are from charitable trusts and they say, how do I re-register? What is the impact on me? And I can thankfully tell them, there shouldn't be any impact on you because you're not an incorporated society. So one of the first things you should do is check what entity type am I? And maybe it's a refresher to look back. If you are a charitable trust, it might be good for you to be looking at your rules and updating them anyway um, for reasons that I'll go into at the end. Um, but I just want to be clear, the Incorporate Societies Act is changes for incorporated societies. Um, the one exception, it's possible for charitable trusts to have registered as incorporated societies. The point is do a little bit of homework as to what entity type you are, um, and that should help. But there's there's 23,000 of them. They all need to re-register. How many of you, how many do you think have re-registered so far? Any guesses? Um, this is a rhetorical question you don't actually have to answer. I asked MB, the company's office, um, a couple of days ago just to get the number, and they told me it's about 2,000 which have re-registered. 2,000 out of 23,000. So what does this show us? 
less than 10% have re-registered so far. So if you're one of those groups, you might need to be advancing your uh, re-registration process. I know right now it's the middle of AGM season, so it's possible groups are adopting their new rules and then they will be re-registering. So um, let's go to a little bit more, uh, Michelle touched on this, um, but at the bottom of the screen, you can see the original Incorporated Society's uh, rules was actually from the 1890s. Um, it was 18 sections. The 1908 Act had 40 sections, and the 2022 Act has 270 sections. So there's an upgrade in terms of the number of requirements for incorporate societies. But just to echo that it actually needed to be done. Like how many of you listening were alive in 1908, right? <laughs> it's a long time ago. The rules were outdated. They needed an upgrade. And that's what the new act has provided, a clearer scope around purpose and a clear framing of what are the duties of officers, a clear requirement for around conflicts and dispute resolution, and a number of things. So timing-wise, um, you have until April of 2026 to re-register as an incorporate society. The timing is important because guess what happens if you do not re-register by April 2026? You will be deregistered. So you will no longer um, have an entity status. So this is a really important to remember that you have basically, what's that, a year and a half left. So um, we're headed into the Christmas season. It's going to go by quick. It's going to be March before we know it, and there'll be one year left. So some of you who are in corporate societies, you need to get on with it. What's the main thing that you need to take away? Well, your rules will need to be updated. Even if you adopted rules in, say, 2018 or relatively recently, the new act has requirements of what your rules have to provide for. So what you're going to need to do is update your rules to ensure that they comply with the new act. That's the most critical part. Once you've done that, um, and I, I would say this is an opportunity to engage with your members to actually reflect on what your rules say. How many of you have actually read your rules? Um, there's a lot of rules which you look at them and you go, we never do that. Well, why is it in your rules then? This is the moment that you can use to actually adopt rules which are specific and relevant and focused for your group. So once you've adopted rules, probably at an AGM or at a special general meeting, um, you then need to re-register. There's no cost to do that. Um, it's basically done online. Um, one of the requirements that's changed is you only have to have 10 members now, whereas previously you had to have 15. Um, so there's some information you have to fill in um, and upload your new rules, and then you will be able to be re-registered and you'll be in the good books <laughs> with company's office. Um, so that's the process um, of and the timing of what it is that needs to happen. Now, I just want to spend a moment on whether it's actually the best structure, though, um, because a lot of people are saying, this is interesting. We have to re-register. Should we re-register? And I think that's an actually, it's almost a philosophical question. The reason that is, is in corporate societies possibly were built around a different type of culture, a culture where people put their hand up to be members. These are member-led democratic institutions. So if you think about uh, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, people were more willing to become members of groups. Today, it is really hard to get people to show up for meetings. And I'm sure you all can testify to this. How many people, maybe you have 75 people who are members, how many show up to the AGM? It's a struggle to get a quorum quite often. So the point is that some groups are saying, should we be an incorporate society? 
Um, I did an article on this topic, uh, which uh, was co-written with Craig Fisher, who's an amazing um, uh, background accountant auditor. So we collaborated on this, asking, is it the right model for your organization? Um, the other things to bear in mind is that incorporate societies can become politicized. So I've had it. This is a real story. I don't want to scare anyone, but on a Friday night, the president calls me hey, we got our AGM tomorrow, looking really great. We just had 70 new people join. Isn't that great? People really love what we're doing. On Monday, the president calls me. It's a different voice because the new members voted out the old people and they voted in a new set of people. So the point of this is for some groups, they've evolved beyond just a couple members meeting and gathering some of them own millions of dollars of assets. They have government contracts. They've got dozens of employees that may not be the appropriate model to stay as an incorporated society. And so we're helping a number of groups with a transition from incorporate society to a charitable trust. Charitable trusts don't have elections. They're a stable, well understood legal entity type. So I think it's incumbent on governance. And I know many of you are fellow lawyers. Some of you are accountants. Some of you are giving advice to incorporate societies. I think a hard question is, should we re-register? We, we have to do something, but should we re-register? Because to be honest, it's about the same amount of work to redo your rules as opposed to drafting new rules for a charitable trust. So just throwing that in, giving you some things to think about. Um, when it comes to the changes, we've pulled together a resource, which I'm very happy to be sent around this little guide. Um, it's a download on our information hub as well. And we go into 10 things that we think that incorporate societies need to be aware of. Um, for example, did you know there's now definitions of what your duties are? They're echoes of what's applicable in companies, um, which is an interesting question in itself, since most incorporate societies are member-led philanthropic type of entities. So should the same standards apply as apply to companies? Um, but that's one of the changes. There's definitions of who is an officer. It's probably wider than you might think. Um, do you have significant influence over decisions? It's, so there's some changes there. Um, and then there's requirements around having conflict of interest provisions, dispute resolution provisions. So there's a few things you need to be um, getting right for your new rules um, before you re-register. And then I'm going to throw in a bonus here, which is there's been changes to the Charities Act recently. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but they that got updated as well. The reason I mention this is that this has a flow on implication for incorporate societies and other entity types. So basically, there's a requirement now that every three years, you need to be reviewing your rules and checking that they are fit for purpose and assisting to achieve the charitable purposes. So this is for registered charities, just to hopefully this is clear. It's not all charities are registered charities. Registered charities get the tax exemptions and you know you can give donation receipts to people who give money. Um, but I thought I'd throw that in because some of you are from trusts or your other advisors. It's important to remember that registered charities need to be checking their rules. And I think actually, when you look at your incorporate society's rules, you might notice that they're dated 1973 or 1957, or, you know, 2008. Rules and legal documents should be updated from time to time so that they keep pace with changes, even within society. And I think it's incumbent on us in governance roles to always be upgrading our rules. So in a, in a charitable trust, that would be your trustee, incorporate society, it's your um, constitution or your rules. But also, what policies do you have in place? Because this requirement is not just about your rules. It's about your procedures and your policies as well. Do you have a privacy policy? 
Do you have a child protection policy? Do you have a dispute resolution policy? Do you have a conflict of interest policy? There's a lot of things that might be appropriate for your group. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, for some of you, it might just be a reminder, but um, I thought I would throw that in. And then the last thing is we've got heaps of resources. I love connecting with people on LinkedIn and I'm posting there all the time. So that's the QR code. Um, and I'm doing a podcast for the IOD called Board Matters About Governance. So it might interest you. And at the top, those are charities health checks, those documents. They're all free downloads. And hopefully that would be of help to some of you. Um, I'm looking forward to the questions. Please keep them coming. We are wanting those hard questions. Um, on our um, information hub, we have a download of 150 Q and A's. So I'd love to get more answers to questions that we can add there. Um, so be dropping them in the Q and A. So now I'm gonna hand over to Jay from the IRD and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Great, thanks Stephen. That's, um... I think certainly given everyone lots to think about. Um, yeah, my name is Jay Casey. I'm a technical specialist at Inland Revenue. Um, I have a background in not-for-profits and charities and various different entity types, including incorporated societies. Um, I'm going to share a presentation with you. So hopefully that is loaded up for you. And I'm going to just very briefly talk about some of the filing requirements and income tax exemptions um, and then that'll flow on to talking about what you need to think about if you're re-registering um, and I'll just provide some suggestions on maybe what you want to include in your constitution and then I will talk about um, what happens if you deregister as an incorporated society. Okay, so a couple of the most common income tax exemptions that, that might apply to you are the charitable entity income tax exemption. So that's if you register with charity services. And then the other one is the amateur sporting body income tax exemption. Um, yeah, and so I'll talk about when you're doing your constitution, maybe some of the things you might want to include so you can get that second income tax exemption. Um, and then we also have a, a not-for-profit deduction that's available. So if you register with IRD um, for a not-for-profit status, you can then get a $1,000 deduction off your income. Um, so it's lesser of $1,000 or your taxable income. And at the time that you register with us um, as having a not-for-profit status, if it's expected that you won't have any taxable income or it'll be under that $1,000. So once you claim your $1,000, you won't have any taxable income. We will often then put you in our system as not needing to file income tax returns. Um, but it's important to understand that that's not an income tax exemption. That's just a, you get to claim a $1,000 deduction and we'll um, remove your filing obligation. But if at any point in time in the future your taxable income does exceed $1,000 and you'll have tax to pay, you must file an income tax return. So you'll need to get in contact with us and tell us that um, for that particular year you're going to need to file a return because we'll need to activate that period for you. Okay, so if you're going to re-register as a, an incorporated society, um, it should mean that there won't be any tax changes for you. But if you are wanting that not-for-profit status, and perhaps you've had it in the past, there's specific things that you need to include in your constitution. Okay, so for not-for-profit status, in the revenue requires more restrictive clauses than the Incorporated Societies Act. And just to give an example, so under the Incorporated Societies Act, you can pay grants and scholarships to your members and you can provide payments in situations of hardship. But if you're wanting not-for-profit status within the revenue, you won't be able to do that. So, yeah, as I said, it's more restrictive to get that not-for-profit status with us. And on the Incorporated Societies website, there's a constitution builder, but that constitution builder doesn't include the clauses that are needed to get that not-for-profit status within the revenue. So to get that status within the revenue, your constitution must contain no private benefit to members clause. 
your alteration to rules provision must maintain not-for-profit purposes and your winding up clause must not allow distributions to members. And if you're wanting the amateur sporting income tax exemption, your winding up clause must require the assets to be distributed to another amateur sporting organisation or to a charity. So we actually have on our website the wording that you will want to use in your constitution to get that not-for-profit status. So if you go to our website and you search on getting confirmed as a not-for-profit, you'll be taken to a page that provides this information I've got on the slide. So I'll just quickly read through it. So there's three clauses that you need to include in your constitution. One of them is under the personal benefit. So this wording is all on our website, but as a not-for-profit organisation, the officers and members must not receive any distributions of profit or income from it. This does not prevent officers or members from receiving reimbursement of actual or reasonable expenses incurred or entering into transactions with the organisation with goods or services supplied to or from them, which are uh, at arm's length, relative to, to what would occur between unrelated parties provided no officer or member is allowed to influence any such decision made by the organisation in respect of payments or transactions between it and them, their direct family or any associated entity. So you'd need something in your constitution along those lines under the personal benefit. And then under alteration of rules, you would need to have something like no addition to, deletion from, or alteration of organisation rules shall be made, which would allow personal financial gain to any individual. And then under the winding up clause, you would need on winding up or dissolution of the organisation, any surplus funds or assets shall not be paid or distributed to any members or individuals, but shall be applied to a purpose in line with organisation's objects or given or transferred to another not-for-profit organisation. And if you're wanting the amateur sporting um, income tax exemption, you'd actually need to have another part under winding up saying that you will transfer or dispose of your assets to another amateur sporting organisation or to a charity. So that wording's all on our website. You can go in there and pretty much just copy from our website for that. And then if you're deciding that you actually are going to cease to be an incorporated society, maybe you'll become unincorporated or you might decide you want to be a company or a charitable trust. This um, just a few things you need to know around the, the tax issues. So first of all, you're going to need a new IID number and that includes if you become unincorporated, you're actually a new entity, you need a new IID number. The new IID number will need to be supplied to banks and financial organisations. Any GST or employer PAYE registration you had with us would need to be changed over to the new IID number. Any tax invoices you issue for GST would need to have the new IID number on it. Any tax returns that get filed will be filed under the new IID number. New unincorporated organisation or other entity type that you choose won't have the former incorporated society's income tax exemption or not-for-profit status. So you'll have to reapply under the new IID number. And when the former incorporated society is removed from the register, Inland Revenue will cease its IID number. And if you decided just to completely wind up, you just need to follow your rules in your constitution. And if the former incorporated society was a registered charity and had the charitable income tax exemption, the assets need to be transferred to another registered charity or the deregistration tax may be payable. So you might be asking, what's that? Well, so this only applies if you were a registered charity with charity services and you've decided to come off that register. Um, you have 12 months to transfer your assets to another charity or to apply them to charitable purposes. If that situation is going to apply to you, um, get in contact with us and we'll just help you through that. And that is all from me. So hopefully that's been useful. I'll now hand over to Michelle from the XRB. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. Um, kia ora and hello, everyone. My name is Michelle Lombard. I'm the Director of Accounting Standards at the External Reporting Board, or in short, XRB. Um, Although we will be covering off our reporting requirements that's been brought in by this new Act, 
we thought we might just give you an introduction of who the XRB is, because we know many incorporated societies might not have dealt with us in the past, so that you might not know who we are and what we do and how we fit into the New Zealand's reporting environment. The External Reporting Board um, is an independent crown entity, and we're responsible for setting and issuing financial reporting, auditing, and climate standards in New Zealand. The standards we are, that we set are used by many New Zealand entities, and that helps them produce their external reports, such as financial statements. These standards are here to ensure reported inf information is relevant, trusted, and can be used for effective decision making. We work across a number of sectors. This includes for-profit, not-for-profit, and public sectors. Our standards are multi-tier and multi-sector reporting frameworks. So what that means is when someone, like incorporated societies, come into our reporting frameworks, we're able to scale it to meet your needs and the, to make it relevant, so that relevant information gets produced for incorporated societies, for example. So in terms of how we fit into New Zealand's reporting environment, it's important to know that we only decide what information gets reported. We don't get to decide who must report our standards. So for incorporated societies, MB decided or developed legislation and they brought incorporated societies under um, legislation and within the ambit of the external reporting board and um, reporting frameworks. Um, so that takes us into our reporting frameworks. I'll hand over to Alex. He'll take you through the agenda and the reporting that's now and that's that will be required going forward. Thanks, Alex. Cool. Um, thanks, Michelle. So, hello everyone. My name is Alex Stainer, and I'm a project manager at the External Reporting Board, and I work within the accounting standards team. So, in terms of what um, I'm going to cover, I'd like to outline the new requirements for when you prepare your financial statements how you determine which accounting standard that you'll need to apply. And I'll just give a brief overview of our tier four and tier three standards. So what are the new financial reporting requirements of the new act? And so very simply, some incorporated societies will need to prepare their financial statements in line with the XRB reporting standards. However, it's really important to note that not all have to. There is one exception. And it's those societies that meet the criteria of a small society as defined in the Act, they can actually choose. So these societies can either follow the requirements set out in Section 104 of the Act, or they can use XRB reporting standards. So just want to note that for all other societies, the legislation does not provide an option to follow the requirements set in Section 104 of the Act and instead refers to preparing financial statements in accordance with generally accepted accounting practice, or GAAP for short, and in some cases, a non-GAAP standard. So where these terms are referred to uh, in the legislation, they're actually defined to mean the applicable financial reporting standards issued by the XRB. So um, with that in mind, this really means that all incorporated societies that do not meet the criteria to be a small society must apply the XRB standards. And I just want to quickly note that those societies that are already registered charities, the charities legislation will still apply to you for your financial reporting requirements. And in fact, charities already apply the XRB standards and have been doing so for a number of years. So more on our XRB standards shortly, um, but first I'd just like to cover off what a small society is. So the criteria to be a small society is that you must have both your operating payments and your current assets less than $50,000 in each of your last two financial years, and your society must not be a registered charity or an approved only organisation with a main revenue. So first I just want to note that operating payments are the total of your expenses that are actually paid during the year, so either in cash or from your bank account, and it excludes capital payments such as purchasing assets or debt repayments. With current assets, these are the assets that are expected to be used or sold within 12 months after your society's financial year end. 
And this may include assets like your general cash in the bank. Whereas in contrast, there's non-current assets and these are expected to be held for a much longer period and would typically include equipment or a building as such. So ultimately, if you are a small society, you can choose to prepare your financial statements in line with the requirements set in Section 104 of the Act, or you can apply the XRB standards. Now, I just want to note that the requirements within the Act in Section 104 are practically the same requirements as in the old Act. And so what this means is for societies electing to use those requirements, nothing much changes. You can still largely continue to prepare your financial statements in the same way that you've always done. Now, for all other societies, you will need to apply the XRB framework and standards. And there are three sectors that we issue financial reporting standards for the not-for-profit public sector and the for-profit sector. And to work out the specific accounting standard that you would apply, you first need to identify which sector applies to you. Now, for incorporated societies, it should be straightforward. Uh, most societies will be not-for-profit entities for the purposes of the XRB framework and therefore can apply the not-for-profit reporting standards. And I'll just say that we expect this based on primary nature of what most societies do and have been started for. And the XRB considers that a not-for-profit is an entity that aims primarily to deliver goods or services for a community or a social benefit. And this is not uh, any surpluses are not intended to be returned to those, um, like a return on equity as such. So it, this does not mean that if you generate a surplus at the end of the year, that you cannot be a not-for-profit. It just goes back to your intention and what you will use those surpluses for. Now, we do acknowledge that there could be an exception. Uh, so if you aren't sure, please feel free to check uh, one of our documents on our website, the XRBA1 and in Appendix A, there's some guidance there. So once you've confirmed the relevant sector, uh, we have our applicable accounting standards uh, grouped by reporting tiers. And so you'll see that these tiers are based on the financial size of an organization. And so we have tiers one and two, and these are for our larger organizations and they are subject to more complex requirements. Tier three is for our mid-range to smaller organizations and the requirements are, are more simpler and straightforward than tiers one and two. And then finally, we have our tier four, which is for our smallest organizations. And this standard is designed to be applied by anyone, including those without any expertise in accounting. And actually, we expect that out of all the societies that are required to apply the XRB standards, that the majority will end up using the Tier 4 standard. Now, just one other point. Um, for societies that own or control another entity, the reporting tier must be assessed based on the sum of your total expenses and operating payments across the society and all entities it controls. Now, these requirements only take effect once your society has re-registered under the new Act. So from that date, you must apply the new requirements to the preparation of your next set of financial statements. So for example, if your society has a financial year of 30 June and decides to re-register in December 2024, if you had already completed your 30 June 2024 financial statements, your society would apply the new requirements to the 30 June 2025 financial year. And just one other point is that you must complete your financial statements along with your annual return and file these within six months of your society's financial year end as well. Now, if you are a registered charity, uh, you will still be subject to the charities legislation on this point. In terms of audit requirements, these will only apply when you are not a charitable entity as the charity legislation will apply for your audit requirements if you are. And your society and all the entities it controls, you must have operating expenditure of $3 million or more in each of your last two financial years for this to apply. Now we understand that a number of societies have their financial statements reviewed or audited already. 
And this may be due to other legislation such as the Charities Act, or it might be a requirement agreed in your own constitution. Nothing needs to change here. It just means those societies that meet this criteria will, by legislation, have to be audited. Now, I just want to give a very brief overview of the Tier 4 standard. So this is a single New Zealand reporting standard. So it's one document with all your requirements in it. It is considered to be a non-GAAP standard. Um, it is cash-based. So transactions are recorded in the financial statements only when cash is received or paid. So that might be through your bank account or physical cash. Now, you will need to prepare two statements. So we have the statement of service performance, and we also have the statement of cash received and cash paid. And you'll also need to apply, uh, provide explanatory information uh, in the accounting policies and notes. Now, with the statement of service performance, um, this is intended to outline the performance of your society from a non-financial information perspective. And so this would ask you to present the main activities that you've undertaken during the year and provide a measure of these. And so as an example, this might be the number of events you've held or teams that you've put together or other meetings that you've held or new members that you've attracted. It's to do with that type of activity. Now the statement of cash received and cash paid summarizes all the transactions recorded through your bank account or that you've received or paid in physical cash during the year and it asks you to classify these individual transactions into common groups or common line items that you can then present within the statement. So the format of the statement and the classifications used are all set out in the standard itself and it's just important to note that you can change the names of these common groups to make it more understandable to those that are going to actually read your financial statements. Now the other component is the accounting policies and notes and the first thing that you will need to do is just do a description of how your entity has done its accounting and what we mean by this is ultimately a statement of compliance that you've used the tier 4 standard that you've recorded your transactions on a cash basis and then we would ask that you also include a description of how you've accounted for GST, whether it's GST inclusive or exclusive. Now the next part is information on significant assets and liabilities. And I note that no balance sheet or statement of financial position is required. You will just need to list out your significant assets and liabilities and include an amount for them. And finally, there is a related party disclosure and this is to confirm whether the society has entered into any transactions with those that are closely related or have close relationships. And I note that those that do have close relationships are listed in the standard, but generally include individuals or their close family members that have influence over the decisions of the society. So it might be your committee, your board members, or even your management. Now, the last point on the slide is that it is a first year concession. So what this concession is, it means that you can apply the tier four standard from just your current financial year. You do not need to go back and apply the standards requirements to your previous financial year or even display any previous year information in it. Instead, it would just ask that you attach a copy of your previous year financial statements. Um, access to the standard guidance and templates are all on our website and we'll step you through these requirements. And I just wanted to note that actually last year we produced a short animated video that describes how you can use our tier four template. Uh, links to this are on our XRB website. And if you do have a few minutes, it's, it's worth a look. And finally, um, I'll just briefly go through the tier three standard. And it, this is for organizations that are larger than tier four. However, it's still intended to have straightforward requirements, especially where your society may not be subject to much complexity. So again, it is a single New Zealand reporting standard, one document with all your requirements. And this is considered a generally, it's considered generally accepted accounting practice or GAP. Um, it is accrual based. And so this means that transactions are recorded as they occur rather than when cash is received or paid. And like the tier four standard, there is also a first year concession. So you can attach a copy of your previous year financial statements instead of applying the requirements to your previous financial year. 
Now, in terms of the requirements, is a little bit more than tier four. Um, so with the statement of service performance, it builds on those tier four requirements. Uh, you will need to provide information um, of your, about the objectives of your society and what it's aiming to achieve over the medium to long term. To give an example, a society's mission or purpose could be to support and promote participation in a, support, in a sport. Uh, maybe there is medium to long-term goals of increasing youth participation or improving facilities or increasing engagement with the community. You would then tie the activities that you've undertaken during the year to those items. Now with the statement of financial performance, position and cash flows, there are presentation and format requirements. Accordingly, there are classifications and accounting policies for how you record and recognize these specific items of revenue, expenses, assets, liabilities into these particular statements. And finally, with the accounting policies and the notes, again, it's a description of how your entity has done its accounting, so you need to include a statement of compliance. And with the notes, um, this is where you include all the explanatory information that will be useful to your readers, and the standard does specify notes that are required when they are applicable to your society. Now, if you are after more information, please, please visit our website or um, get in contact with us. Excellent, thank you very much. I do want to just add one more thing to Alex's point. Um, although there's a few requirements that he has made for tier three and tier four reporting entities, um, we actually put a lot of templates on our website to make it as simple as possible. Um, it sounds like a lot, but once you open up the templates, you'll see it's really not as much as what it sounds like. All right. Thanks, Katie. Oh, kia ora. Thanks, everyone. Um, for that, what a whiz through whistle stop tour of all things incorporated societies. And what I would really like us to do is, I think, go right back to the beginning. And I'm wondering, Stephen, if you could kick us off and anyone else can can join in, but but really and keep those questions coming um, in the QA as well. And and big thank you, particularly to you, Stephen, for um quickly, you know, answering in real time many of those um, questions as they've come in. But I know that certainly um something that that I learned coming in and is is that we use the same names for things and it makes things really confusing. So you have your entity type and you can be an incorporated society or a, or a charitable trust, but then you can also be a charitable trust that's incorporated and also incorporated societies, um, you know, also have charitable purposes. So can you demystify a little bit for us um, some of those some of those terms? Thank you. Steve. Sure, that sounds fine. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. It's um, it's it, you're right. Terminology gets confusing. Um, as a lawyer, I sometimes get confused when it comes to accounting because there's so many acronyms, and it's like, what what acronym does this mean? And it's the similar with the legal side of things. So I find it easiest just to start from the beginning. Remember, purpose and impact is the heart of what the organization does. That comes first. So all charities have to be clear on the purpose and the impact that they're set up. They have to be doing one of four things, advancing education, reducing poverty, advancing religion, or a purpose beneficial to the community. Those are the four heads of charity. So then what happens is you choose the legal entity type. So you could be a charitable trust, a company, an incorporated society or an unincorporated society. So just to be clear on that one, because it is confusing, unincorporated societies have not incorporated. So there's not a separate legal entity that exists separate from the members. So an unincorporated society is a group of people saying, hey, I love this type of car. You love this type of car. Let's come together. We now have the Mustang Club and unincorporated societies, we love Mustangs. That's not yet an entity that has a company's office number. And it also, here's the key point, those members are liable for what that club is doing. 
So the best example would be if you're entering into a lease, the lease would be in the names of the people rather than an entity because there is no incorporated entity. So an incorporated society has taken the next step and said, here's our rules, we incorporate and we exist. So the point is there's different legal entity types and then all of those legal entity types are doing purpose. Then there's a question, should we register as a charity? And that's with charity services. So you could have an entity which is incorporated with company's office, but is not a registered charity. An example is every Rotary Club in New Zealand. We all know what Rotary is. None of them are registered charities. They are incorporated societies, but not registered charities. Why would you register as a charity? Because you get tax concessions, which we've been hearing about from Jay. Um, and you're able to say, we are part of the club of 29,000 other charities. So hopefully that helps give a demystify a little bit of the thinking around the type of entity. Go back, check what entity type you are. I've had many come to me and say, oh, we're an incorporate society. I look at their rules. They are not. They are a charitable trust. None of this applies mm -hmm. to them. So double check. And I think that can be particularly confusing because, of course, you can be a charitable trust, um, you know, as we are, and you can then incorporate. That doesn't mean you're an incorporated society, um, but it means it's sort of an added layer of protection for the board, essentially, because the, the liability is on the organisation rather than them as individual um, trustees. So I think clarifying that is, is really important. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful explanation. That's exactly, it's the same principle. If you don't incorporate your charitable trust, then the trustees are liable. Same principle as with an unincorporated society. Mm. And of course, it doesn't mean that you're an incorporated society. So the first thing is, um, as we sent out in the registration, and as you can do now, is just to, if you are unsure, you can double check. You can go um, to charity services and ch search the register of charitable trusts. And the same thing you could do at the company's office. You can search the register of incorporated society. So that's your first step. Um, you know, if you're new coming into a role and you're not sure, um, then, you know, then you can check that out. Can it? Sure. Yeah, sure. Um, so, um, Stephen, if people are thinking about, um, uh, oh, that's that, we really lost that one. Oh, yeah, well, this was, oh. it, it was really just about, and then you can do all the technical <laughs> ones, because Michelle's <laughs> much better on the technical stuff than me. But this is just, um, if you're thinking about re-registering, and you're thinking, okay, so we know we're in a corporate society. Do we still want to be one? And you sort of hinted at that with some of what you said. What would you encourage people to think about? You know, what is the, the benefits of being an incorporated society over a charitable trust? You know, what, what should people think about when they're trying to decide uh, what they want to do? And I would add, um, are you seeing a lot of people actually going through that process mm -hmm. and making those decisions? Yeah, it's a, these are great questions. And yes, I am. And I think that the fundamental point is to talk with your members, talk with your leadership and ask, this might sound like a hard question, but is this legal entity type serving our purpose the best way possible? So for example, if you um, have an organization which employs 30 or 40 people and has government contracts worth $5 million, owns property, the incorporate society's model is probably not the most appropriate structure for you. You might have evolved into that as well. But if you are, as an example, the local tennis club, and there's 55 people, and you meet every Saturday, and you play tennis, and you're all communal, and hey, Jane, you're the president next year. Hey, John, would you be the treasurer? You know, it's a community. It's a member-led organization. Totally the right structure for you. So it's more about what are we trying to do and what's the legal entity type that will best serve our purpose. In the same way that I've got four children, so I need a seven-seater car, even though I'd quite like to drive, you know, a two-seater convertible, it's not, I have to look at what's the attributes of each and say, it's more appropriate to be this type. Have the courage to ask that hard question as well. Um, but remember the legacy can continue. 
It's just you're using potentially a more appropriate vehicle to get from A to B. So um, yeah, those are my thoughts on that. Anything anyone else wants to add and then we'll we'll move on. Um, I am sort of summarizing some of the questions in the chat. I know you've answered some of them, but um, can you speak to the um, issue, Stephen, around st uh, staff members becoming, having to be officers and registered um, and implications for organizations and challenges? Yeah. Yeah, so in the chat, there's a nice little back and forth going there. Um, and yeah, this is definitely a big change. So in the chat, I put the definition of an officer. Essentially, I, my view and the person who put the question is that it's probably capturing more people than in the past, because it's about who can exercise significant influence over decisions. So um, in the past, you would have said, well, the officers are the people who are appointed. You know, we voted these people in. Those are the officers. Now I think it probably captures your treasurer, your accountant, even I hate to say it, potentially a lawyer providing advice, you know, like if you're exercising significant influence. So the challenge is for each of you in your organizations to think about who exercises influence and did we intend it that they would be officers or not? Because the officers have duties that apply to them. So that's the really key point. Um, yeah, so it's definitely a uh, controversial uh, among all the changes. I'm just going to do a quick, there's a, a question that's just come through in the chat that relates to our previous question, just to be completely clear. Someone's asking about the difference between an incorporated society that's a registered charity and a charitable trust that is incorporated, which I feel like sums up that conversation. Is there a sort of a, a way in which we can just um, describe describe that difference to people? Um, incorporation, incorporation protects the members, whether it's a charitable trust or an incorporated society. Before incorporation, it's just individuals. Incorporation creates a new entity legally separate to the individuals. That could be by incorporating the trustees as a charitable trust board, or it could be by incorporating the society as an incorporated society. So it's ways to protect people, to give them assurance that they will not be personally liable. So I encourage incorporation, it's free and it protects you, but you should check if you're incorporated, because I have met a lot of groups that are not incorporated. And it's always my first question is, why haven't you incorporated? Mm. It's just confusing. They use the same terms, but but thank you for that. Should we go to this? Mm. Yeah. Um, so we're not just aiming them all at Stephen, I'm um, broadening it out. I had a, um, a question around thinking about the uh, for Michelle and Alex uh, in terms of reporting um so I'm an incorporated society and I'm also a, a registered charity so I'm already meeting a whole pile of reporting requirements um what are the differences um that I'm going to need to look out for um my first sort of read through a year or so ago I was thinking that it looked like um if I'm meeting charities, services, reporting requirements, I'm going to be meeting a lot of the new stuff. But um, yeah. Yeah, that, that is right. So actually with these new requirements, new financial reporting requirements that have come in from corporate societies, they specifically note in the legislation that if you are a registered charity, you continue to follow the charity legislation for it. But what you will see is that they are effectively the same. The charity legislation notes that if you're a charity, you must apply the XRB standards or they will say generally accepted accounting practice or a non-GAAP standard. And you'll see that the new incorporated societies uh, requirements do the same thing, except they you know, carve out the small society um, provision, but that provision can only apply to a society that is not a registered charity. Um, that's really awesome. Thank you, Alex. Um, do you think so? That yeah, I think let's go to that general one. So the um, just we had a couple of questions and thoughts about. So what happens if we don't? If we don't re-register, 
what will actually happen? And I know that all three groups um, of you will have some some thoughts, some thoughts on this. What happens? What happens if you don't re-register? You get deregistered, so you don't exist anymore. <laughs> it's pretty, it's pretty um and you know, it's the the death of the entity. So it's important to re-register is the short answer. But Jay, um, you've been there as well. Maybe from an IRD perspective, what what happens mm -hmm. in your world? Um, we will cease the IRD number of the incorporated society that doesn't re-register. And then we would, um, well, you'd need to contact us, but you can continue as an unincorporated society and you'd need a new IRD number for that. And you could then apply for not-for-profit status if you wanted to or if you previously had an income tax exemption you could reapply for those but yes you would certainly need to get in contact with IAD. Mm, there's a couple of questions in the chat as well about what happens to the assets of that entity and I heard something you were talking about having a year um, I guess it's the same as the wind down is it the same as the wind down where you'd have a year to make sure that those assets are transferred? Um, so if you're going from incorporated to unincorporated, then I guess the day that the incorporated society deregisters, those assets have no doubt by default transferred to the unincorporated society. Um, if you were a registered charity, then you need to talk to IRD to let us know what's happening because, yeah, that could be a bit more of a problem. So just, yeah, please get in contact with us. But if you're not a charity and you're just uh, not for profit, um, if you were incorporated society and become unincorporated, then the assets would just transfer over to the what's effectively a new unincorporated society, and you'd mm, need a new if, ID number. But if you're deregistered and you and you cease to become an entity, what would happen then? Hopefully, well, we you're a, that you're an, that was, you, yeah yeah that was well well you're in from our point of view you're now an unincorporated society. Um, one of the sort of drivers, I think, in the last kind of decade, at least, in terms of like additional incorporation is the AMFL um, and uh, the way banks will, will want you to be a registered entity to have a bank account. Um, that's not really, I'm not formulating that as a question, but um, do you see, so if you deregister and you become unincorporated, you may run into some issues with your bank i imagine is that is that a fair assumption um you would certainly need a new iid number um i'm not really sure what else the bank might require um you might need a new set of rules or are you following your previous rules but you're now following them as an unincorporated society i'm not quite sure but yeah i think there'd be lots of things to consider there and that might bring us on well to the, the questions about the constitution. So, um, you know, we were hearing in, in the chat about people talk about constitutions, they talk about rules, they're essentially um, talking about the same thing. But I wondered, you know, there are lots of people wanting to know, how do we know that we are thinking about the right things when we're putting our constitution together, that we are considering making sure that it's got all the right things that it needs to have in it. We heard that there's a constitution builder, but we also heard that it's missing the information that IRD might require for that kind of not-for-profit um, entity, that status. So any thoughts or advice, um, you know, when, when incorporated societies are going about redoing um, redoing their constitutions? Um, I'll say one thing and then maybe Michelle or whoever, um, I, I just say you're right. And I'm glad you raised it. There is a constitution builder on company's office. So that's a free resource. Um, so that is something that people can use. So that's there. Um, what I've found is that sometimes it's putting in every possible thing <laughs> and it becomes quite a long document. So I would encourage you to read it for yourself maybe look at the guides that I've been mentioning and make make the document work for your organization. At the very start of the Incorporated Societies Act, it says 
we want you to have your tikanga, your custom, your practice, like they're encouraging it. You could even translate some of it, you know, with the headings and things. The point is make it work for you. Um, what I've found is that when people brought the constitution builder format of rules, they, it, they're cumbersome and maybe doesn't cover this unique situation of that entity. And that's where your lawyer or somebody could help to make it really work for you. So we we have our own template version that we think is obviously the best in New Zealand, <laughs> but that's what we use with our clients and we would customize it to be specific for them. Um, but, you know, it's up to, it, it is a free resource, but, you know, you get what you pay for it from my experience. Michelle? Yeah. Um, Stephen, it's all great points. I just wanted to add, um, I think historically, and Alex touched on it in his slides from our end, but historically, a lot of constitutions for incorporated societies would have included an audit requirement. So just thinking about whether or not you have a legal mandate to be audited, um, if you don't, um, being clear if you actually want that audit requirement in that constitution is probably a very important thing to think about through your members. Is it audit that you're after? Is it a review that you're after? Or what is it actually that you're after? What type of assurance product is it that your members will actually need um, for the financial reporting side of it? Mm. There's quite a lot of awesome additional questions in the chat, but I am... Um... Something that um a relatively kind of straightforward one I think is around the, the ten members, um and there was a question earlier about uh not having enough uh members and what that means. So can you speak briefly, Stephen, to the um definition of a member? So that this is an purposes? yeah, this is an ongoing requirement. Um, so it's important to remember that you need to keep good records of your members. Um, and essentially it's down, it's individuals. So Stephen's a member and Michelle's a member and Katie's a member. That's three people. If it's a corporate member, so if there's an entity which is a member, it counts as three. So that's important to remember as well. That's mainly used where an incorporate society has a number of other entities which are members rather than individuals. So if you had, say, four corporate members, that would be more than the 10 required. Um, but it will be an ongoing requirement is that you'll need to have 10. Remember what I said, it used to be 15, so they've reduced it, which I think is actually recognizing society has changed and how hard it is to get members. Um, but you'll need to have 10. So the practical side guess what? I think a lot of people are calling their cousin, their sister, their father, their mother. <laughs> Can you help us get to 10? Um, because that's the requirement. So um, it's a little bit of a box ticking from my perspective, but it is a requirement that you have in an ongoing way, the 10 members. Is there any guidance out there at the moment about um, how you how you best capture consent to be a member? Um um, my view is that you can do that electronically. Um, it, traditionally, you would have said get a signature, you know, like a pen on ink uh, <laughs> way, and that's fine. Um, but my best practice would be why not develop a very short form for people to confirm I would like to become a member. This is my name and this is my contact details. I tick this box to confirm that I have agreed or something that later on you can point back to and say, yes, there was some form of consent. A traditional club would say, no, we wanna get it in writing, like we want the signatures. And that's fine too. I just think we've probably moved on as a society and you could do it electronically pretty easily. Thank you, sounds good. Yeah, sure. So there's a, a question here really for, for Michelle and Alex around um, creating financial reports to XRB standards? Um, and, you know, is it that you need to be using software like Xero, MYOB um, to do that? Or um, or what, you know, what would you suggest? Does it depend on the tier level um, that you're at? Yeah. yeah no. prob oh, sorry, Michelle. You can... No, Alex, you go. I was just going to say that, look, Xero and MYOB can be really helpful for recording your transactions and classifying them into, you know, the appropriate categories. But the XRB, we do actually have templates 
on our website for the actual report. So if you're a tier four, we've got those templates on our website. They list out, you know, they give you the, the right format, the different categories, and really just you need to input your numbers into it. Same with tier three, we've got all the templates there. Now I do know that on Xero that you can customize reports and you can create reports that are compliant um, with our tier three and tier four standard. So maybe there's some that are available to you. Otherwise you might be creating that from scratch. And I think that having our templates is probably an easier option. But I also just want to say that, you know, having Xero and MYOB is really valuable from that bookkeeping perspective and just keeping on top of having your financial information processed as you go. And many of us do use those sorts of software programs. So is there information on your website about which custom report we need to um, be producing? Yeah, uh, not in terms of within Xero or MYOB. Really, we just stick to what we have, which is our template. So if you're in tier four, we will have a tier four template that you can download and use. Um, same with tier three, but we haven't gone into talking about the custom reports within Xero or MYOB. I'm going to put a shout out that that's something that would be um, really mm -hmm. useful um, for incorporated societies to be able to use the existing software that they have if they do um, if they do have that. So I'm just going to put that one out there. Thank you. I can ask you a question around. Yeah, yeah. Or do you want to take No, you go. Um, because we're kind of coming close to the end, I've got a kind of closing out question um, in terms of the process for re-registering. Um, the question that came up in the chat is, um, what do we file? What do the timeframes look like? And um, you know, if we re-registered re our, um, we filed like next month, how long would it take to all come into effect and be processed? What do we have to do afterwards? Um, I can start that answer. I think it's uh, an online form. So the, the basic answer is that you need to adopt the new rules. You need to um, go online and confirm that you have the required number of members, and you need to upload the new rules to re-register. Um, companies office are actually one of the most efficient government agencies that I know of. So they are very quick at... Um, doing processes. Um, I don't have an exact figure of how many days it takes or something like that. But if my experience with setting up new entities is anything to go by, it's, you know, a couple days to, um, to do this. That's my experience. Um, but the others may have comments as well. I think Stephen, you've covered it well. I think, yes, you're fine. I think what's really clear is that this is an issue um, where there's, you know, where there's some confusion, where there are a lot of questions, um, but also where there's lots of information um, available as well. So I certainly know that what we'll be doing is reflecting on this, making sure that the recording of this webinar is available to everybody as well as being uploaded online. And we'll certainly be looking through the chat to see if there's any other information mm. we can provide in the follow-up email that that, um, that shares that recording with with everybody um, as well. Is there anything you want to add before we close? Oh, I just want to say a huge thank you to Michelle, Alex, Jay and Stephen for sharing your insights and uh, it's been incredible. Um, my mind mine was kind of going all over the place listening and looking at the chat so there's so much to take in and very very immensely grateful for your contributions. Yeah absolutely um, echo that Michelle thank you. And yeah, so we'll keep be we'll keep providing some you know some content and information um, on this issue and others um, further. Thank you so much, all of you, for joining us for taking up your your lunch time to do so. And I'm just going to um, close us off um, with a karakia. Kia horu te marino, kia whakapapa ponamu te moana, he huarahi matato i te rangi nei, aroha atu, aroha mai. Tato, ia tato katoa, huye, hai, hai.